Well, good morning. Great to see you guys. Thanks for coming to church today. It's a great day to be in the house of God, isn't it? So glad you're here. Uh, pretty obvious to you, I would imagine by now, we're celebrating 25 years as a church. Uh, and we're very excited about it. And, uh, you know, I hope you notice that uh, in the number of people that have responded uh, to Christ, that the numbers are accelerating uh, over the last five, six, seven years from the first set of years. I just believe they're going to keep on accelerating. And our greatest days are still very much in front of us. So, so grateful for that. That's a lot of gumballs, I, I tell you what. So we're going to have some happy kids somewhere and, and worship team guys who can devour all sorts of assorted food. Uh, as it lays around the church. Hey, just want to uh, make a special invitation. Uh, you know, during this month, we are uh, having some of our best ministry friends come in and help us celebrate this month. But as we reach the last weekend of the month, we're all going to come together as a big church family and celebrate. And one of the things that we're doing that we're super excited about is our night of celebration, which is on a Friday night. It's going to be at the Crest Pavilion Center, which is a gorgeous setup. It's going to be fantastic views. We've got a band there. We're going to have all kinds of uh, entertainment for you. It's going to be a great, great evening. Only $25. And that's going to be fantastic. But here's the deal. Today is the last day for you to be able to buy tickets. Uh, the Crest Pavilion has asked us to give a, them a number this early on so they can prep for us. So uh, there is in the seat back in front of you uh, a card uh, that could give you some information. You can use this to register. Uh, you could buy your ticket in the foyer today after service, or you could buy your ticket online. But today is the day. Today is the deadline. And I, if you're especially... If if you're a part of our church family, love to see you there. We're going to have a great time celebrating. Come on, let's celebrate. Night of celebration. It's going to be an incredible time. Hey, I just want to say we're thrilled today to have uh, our great friend, Dr. Terry Christ, is in the house today. And... Um, Terry and Judith Christ are incredible friends, incredible leaders. They pastor uh, uh, an amazing church that's in uh, Scottsdale, Mesa, and Phoenix. Three locations, well over 7,000 members, just making an impact in that community. Terry, Terry's actually the chair uh, of the faith and community segment, uh, sitting and interacting right with Governor Jan Brewer, uh, making an impact on the community. Uh, he's the president of ILM. It just, it just goes on and on. This guy's ridiculous, makes me sick. And um, But uh, we love them, and they have become great, great friends of ours, or great friends of our church, and I couldn't think of a better person to have during our month of celebration than Pastor Terry Chris. So let's stand to our feet. Let's welcome him today. <laughs> wow. God bless you guys. You may be seated this morning. You guys are absolutely on fire. Uh, it is so good to be with you here this morning on this uh, beautiful, rainy North Carolina day. I woke up this morning and looked out of the window and thought for a moment I had died and gone to heaven. It was just that beautiful. And of course, being with you here in this moment is so special. And let me just say that uh, happy 25th, but you don't look a day over 15. You know, the beauty of it is that you are as fresh as a brand new church plant, and yet at the same time, you've earned all 25 years. And there is a depth of maturity, and there is a strength that only comes by uh, pioneering through difficult times together and staying connected to the vision of the house that brings a sense of resonance. And you can feel that deep within the heart of the congregation this morning. It is always a joy of ours to be with you. Judith sends her love. She is unable to be here because this month is National Hispanic Heritage Month. And so Judith spent last evening with Sheriff Joe Arpaio in a very significant event. She spoke, and in fact, she called me last night and she said, I said, how did it go? She said, well, I don't know if I should tell you, but I think the sheriff spent the evening flirting with me. 
She said, but don't do anything about it because he has the power to put you in tent city. And so I'm just going to pretend I don't know that that happened, but uh, she does send her love here this morning. Uh, it's no secret that Judith and I consider your pastors to be some of our dearest friends. It was about 15 years ago that I met Pastor Kirk on the telephone uh, through a phone call that uh, we were connected in, and I was immediately struck by his wisdom and his humility, by his kindness, and by his passion to build a world-class church right here in Asheville. And it has been a privilege over the past few years to actually see the development of that vision up close and personal. So I am so honored to be here today. I am thrilled to see what God has done, and I am most excited to see what God has positioned you for in the coming weeks and months and years. So with all of that said, once again, happy anniversary. In fact, let, let me just say this. I want to get this out of the way. I think I mentioned this last time, but for those who have come to be a part of the church recently, I told my wife and my children and my church board that should anything unexpected ever happen to me that they should call upon pastors Kirk and Suzette to become the next pastor of City of Grace. So I'm just telling you that because I know that you love them so much you're going to pray for my health every single day for the rest of my life. So that is both a statement of how much we love and appreciate them and also a little self-serving and kind of cultivating your prayers as well. Well, this morning I want to begin with a deep theological question. What's up with the zombie craze? What's up with the zombie craze? Have you noticed just how popular zombies have become over the past few years? I mean, they're everywhere. They're on every channel, in every genre, from cartoons to drama to action movies to documentaries. Zombies have taken over the airwaves. In fact, I was recently watching the History Channel where you normally see historical stories when I discovered a documentary on how to survive a zombie apocalypse. This is the History Channel, people. I've seen articles about zombies in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, and even the Daily Beast. I've seen news reports about zombies on Fox and CNN, which is kind of expected, but moving right along. And if that's not strange enough, Sears, Sears, one of America's most traditional stores, is now selling zombie apocalypse survival gear. It's cray-cray out there, <laughs> and apparently it's not going anywhere. In fact, this past week, Showrunner predicted that we're going to see even more of it because The Walking Dead could continue for another 10 years. It's just that popular. Now, without spending too much time on the idea, I think there's something we can learn from the zombie craze. And I realized it recently when I was reading Chuck Osterman's piece in the New York Times called My Zombie, Myself, Why Modern Life Seems Rather Undead. Here's what he said. He said, what if contemporary people are less interested in seeing depictions of their unconscious fears and more attracted to allegories of how their day-to-day -day existence feels? That would explain why so many people Watch the first episode of The Walking Dead. They knew they would be able to relate to it. I think he's absolutely right. The reason so many people relate to zombies is because deep down they realize that they're not living life at its highest and its best. They aren't living fully alive to the purpose of their existence. Now, some would say that's because that life has deteriorated in the modern age. But I don't think that's the case. I think it's because of the original impact of original sin on humanity. The Bible tells us that when man sinned in the Garden of Eden, his sin not only separated him from God, but his sin killed off the part of him that was really alive to God, leaving behind a hollow shell of our existence. Here's how Paul put it in Ephesians 2 verse 1. 
and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Now, that provides the basis for what I really want to talk to you about for a few minutes this morning. You say, what? You're really not going to spend the morning talking about zombies? Not really. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about what brings about the transformation of human beings from their dead in sin existence to people who have been made fully alive. And by the way, it's the same thing that brings communities alive from their dead in sin existence to communities that are fully alive. The very same thing that wakens people also awakens cities and communities and neighborhoods. Over the past few months at City of Grace, I've been talking about restoring cities, rebuilding ruins, and most importantly, renewing lives. And all of that is made possible because of one single thing, the gospel. The gospel brings dead things to life. I want you to think about it this morning. What areas of your life feel dead to God? What areas of your life feel dead to kingdom purpose? What areas in your soul or in your marriage or in relationships to others feel dead? What areas in your community seem dead? If you allow the gospel to work in those areas the same way that the gospel works in the human heart, moving us from dead in our sins to life in Christ, the gospel also working in a marriage will bring it fully alive. The gospel working in a community will bring it fully alive. There is resurrection life resident within the gospel. That's why Paul says in Romans 1 and verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Now, in light of that powerful promise, let me just ask the question, what is the gospel? Maybe you've heard the phrase, but you've never really thought a lot about it. Or maybe you've heard the phrase and you've thought about the gospel in relationship to other things. Maybe you heard somebody say, if you don't straighten up, I'm going to go all gospel up on you. <laughs> or maybe you've heard somebody say, that's the gospel truth, sister. <laughs> Sorry, I, I apologize for that. That was awkward for all of us. <laughs> what is the gospel? I mean, we, we, we think about it in relationship to various aspects of culture, and, and, and as church people, we should really have an understanding of what the gospel is, but I've come to discover that sometimes we make assumptions, and assumptions rarely ever lead us to revelations. So I want to push us right up in this gospel-centered church this weekend, right here on your anniversary, to ask you, what is the gospel? Now, the word gospel appears about 99 times in the New Testament, and it simply means the good news. The gospel is good news for sinful people. The gospel is good news for broken people. The gospel is good news for helpless people. The gospel is good news for hopeless people. And the gospel is good news for all of those self-righteous people who have just heard me describe those other people, and you're sitting here thinking, I don't fit into those categories because I'm not those people. The gospel is good news for all people, but it's not just good news in general. It's a very specific kind of good news. Now, there's nothing wrong with good news in general. But how many of you know good news in general rarely ever has any impact on our personal lives? 
I mean, we're in another election cycle, and all you have to do is watch a couple of commercials to hear an upcoming or incumbent politician proclaiming the possibility of good news for your life, but you've been around long enough to realize that good news in general rarely ever benefits you personally. That's just the way it is. Let me illustrate it this way. How many of you have been following the story of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa? The impact of that globally and now even the visitation of it right here in our nation. For one moment, I want you to imagine that you were diagnosed as being infected with a deadly virus and you were told you've only got three days left to live. Imagine being in a hospital sitting there struggling with the weight of that devastating news when suddenly a nurse walks into you and she says, by the way, I just bumped into your doctor out in the hallway and he wanted me to tell you that he's on his rounds, he's on his way to your room, and he's got some good news for you today. Now imagine three hours later, okay, maybe that's an exaggeration, Two hours and 45 minutes later, the doctor shows up in your hospital room. Why is it that hospital time always feels slower than ordinary time? He walks into your room and he says, by the way, he said, I just want to tell you I've got good news today. In fact, I've got great news today. Did you hear that the stock market is up? I'm going to make a fortune today. And with that, he walks out of your room. Now imagine the next day you're sitting in the hospital room knowing this is day two, feeling the weight of that pressure on you when the nurse walks in again and says, by the way, the doctor's on his rounds, he's coming your direction, and he's got good news for you. And just like the previous day, the doctor walks into your room and says, I've got great news. You know, my daughter's really been struggling in high school, and we didn't realize that whether or not she'd be able to get into college, but oh, by the grace of God, she's gotten into college, and her mother and I are so relieved. Isn't that good news? And with that, he walks out. Now, imagine the same scenario repeats itself on the third day. This is the last day of your life, and you're laying there feeling the weight of hopelessness when the doctor walks in and he says, I've got some good news today. You know, I've been feeling a little run down. I've been feeling a little tired, but I found a way to take a two-week vacation, and so when I leave here, I'm on my way to Bermuda. This will be the last time that we talk. Isn't that good news? Now, I think that's about the moment you reach up and grab him by the stethoscope and you pull him down and you say, hey, buddy, you can take your good news and you can shove it someplace where the sun don't shine. What about some good news for me? See, all good news is not created equal. And the gospel is not just good news in general. The gospel is a very specific kind of good news that relates to a very specific kind of condition. It's the good news that Jesus has set us free from the virus of sin. I mean, the fact is, we've all been infected with it. And we're all terminal because of it. And Romans 5 verse 12 says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Now, I can just imagine somebody sitting here this morning thinking, wait a minute, Terry, is sin really our biggest problem? I mean, we seem to have so many problems in the world, socially, relationally, financially, ecologically, and yet you lay it at the feet of sin? Isn't that some sort of an oversimplification? But see, I think that's the problem. As long as we keep self-diagnosing, we keep coming up with the wrong cure. And the real problem is that we don't want to acknowledge the real problem, so we keep passing around shallow, temporary messages of good news that don't really relate to what's fundamentally wrong with us. And even worse, if we don't face the diagnosis, we will never really appreciate the cure. So, what's wrong with us is sin, and what's right for us is the good news that God has provided for us. 
Now, I know it's your anniversary weekend, and I'm sorry to rain on your parade by talking about sin, but I want to just drive the point on for a couple of moments because the truth is our biggest problem is not political. It's not financial. It's not legal. It's not psychological. It's not social. Our biggest problem is spiritual. If our biggest problem were political, God would have sent us a candidate. If our biggest problem were legal, he would have sent us a lawyer. Insert joke here. If our biggest problem were psychological, he would have sent us a counselor. If our biggest problem was social, he would have sent us a community organizer. Moving right along. Our biggest problem is sin and our greatest need is salvation. So God sends us a savior to bring us good news, but not good news in general, a very specific kind of good news that is related to our actual condition. And here's the beauty of it. If we believe this good news, we can step out of a kingdom ruled by sin and sickness and disease, and despair, and death, and poverty, and fear, and lack, and into another kingdom ruled by righteousness, peace, and joy through the Holy Spirit. And what makes the passageway from one kingdom to another possible is the gospel. It is by hearing and believing the good news of salvation offered to us through Jesus Christ. I love what Michael Horton once wrote. He put it this way. He said, it's interesting that the biblical writers chose the word gospel. The heart of most religions is good advice, good techniques, good programs, good ideas, and good support systems. They drive us into ourselves to find our inner light, inner goodness, inner voice, or inner resources. Nothing new can be found inside of us. There is no inner rescuer deep down in my soul. I just hear echoes of my own voice telling me all sorts of crazy things to numb my sense of fear, anxiety, and boredom, the origins of which I cannot truly identify. But the heart of Christianity is good news. It comes not as a task for us to fulfill, a mission for us to accomplish, a game plan for us to follow with the help of life coaches, but as a report that someone else has already fulfilled, accomplished, followed, and achieved everything for us. Good advice may help in our daily direction. The good news concerning Jesus saves us from sin's guilt and tyranny over our lives and the fear of death. Man, I love that. So if the gospel now is not good advice or self-help or moralism or philosophy or a code of ethics or a call to behavior modification or even good news in general, what is the gospel? Here it is. The gospel is the good news that Jesus suffered, died, and rose again to free us from the power of sin and death and to bring us into a life-changing relationship with God our Father. That's the gospel, period. And it's not just a message that brings us alive to God. It is a message that fuels our life in God. The gospel is not just what this church has been built on for 25 years. The gospel is the basis that will advance this church for the next 25 years and not just advance it generationally, but advance it geographically and spiritually into the lives of people and into the transformation of this community. It's the gospel. I love what Martin Luther once said. He said, I preach the gospel to myself every day. So do I. And not just because I need to get resaved, it's because the gospel working in me is the process of transforming me so that I can access everything that God has provided for me and become everything God has destined me to be. The gospel is not just the passport into the kingdom of God. It is the blueprint for life in the kingdom of God. And when we embrace the gospel, and when we believe the gospel, and when we renew our minds to the gospel, then we are energized by the gospel to do what only the gospel can do working through us. 
I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1. He says, now I would remind you, brothers. We've got to be reminded of this because it's so easy to forget. I would remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Paul says everything else in God's kingdom springs out of this revelation of the gospel. And the beauty of that simple message is that when I turn from my sins and I trust in Jesus to save me by believing in the gospel, that then positions us for a lot of benefits in the kingdom of God. Psalm 68, 19. Blessed is the Lord who daily loads us with benefits. But what I want you to see is that those benefits are not the gospel. They are the blessed results of believing in the gospel. Righteousness and peace and joy and purpose in life and healing and deliverance and blessing and honor and increase and favor and all of the things that we love and things that churches like ours appreciate and celebrate and receive by faith are what God has provided for us, but those things are not the gospel. They're the benefits of the gospel. If you stay centered on the gospel, then the benefits of the gospel are offered to you. But if you focus on the benefits and you substitute them for the gospel, then you lose the foundation that makes the benefits possible working in your life. So I'm on a mission to help get the church re-centered back on the gospel so that we can step back into the power of continued favor and blessing and increase because all of those things are benefits to believing in the gospel. And I'm also on a mission because I've discovered this. The ripple effects of the gospel flow out of the church into the transformation of families neighborhoods, communities, cities, and nations. I love what Jesus shows us in Luke chapter 4 and verse 19. He gives us a glimpse of what can happen in a city when the gospel is declared. Luke 4 verse 19, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news. Everybody say good news good news. We're good news people in a bad news world. To proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So blessing and health and healing and increase and favor all comes out of good news. When the gospel takes root in a city, People come alive to God, and when people come alive to God, they awaken to his kingdom purpose. When people in a church come alive to the gospel, the poor are fed and clothed. Waste places are rebuilt in society. Transformation happens in neighborhoods. Families are reunited and placed back in kingdom purpose. Isaiah 61, 3 says, based on what Jesus is, is quoting here, says they will rebuild the ancient ruins, repairing cities destroyed long ago. They will revive them, though they have been deserted for many generations. It is all because of the gospel. When the gospel is believed and received and proclaimed and lived out in your day-to-day -day life, the city is made better. Hashtag, there goes the neighborhood. It's all because of the gospel. Asheville is so much better because this church is in it. And as you continue to live out the gospel and walk out the gospel and proclaim the gospel, then over the next 25 years, you're going to see this was nothing in comparison to that. And it's not just because of who you are at work in this church, but it's because of what the gospel is at work in you. It's all because of the gospel. Now, I want to sandwich this in real quickly before I'm through. Because the gospel is good news, three practical takeaways for you this weekend. Number one, 
because the gospel is good news, I want everyone to hear the good news. You know, I'm on a mission to proclaim that message to as many people as I can in my lifetime because I've seen what the gospel can do when people embrace it. And I know over the years in church life, now serving as a senior pastor for for a little over 30 years, churches go through seasons and, and churches go through times when we emphasize one part of the scripture because that's where God seems to be dealing with us most significantly in and on. And and I get all of that. That's just a part of the journey. And this is really a journey. But the older I get and the more I see what the gospel can do, the more I come back to the reality of placing the gospel at the center of what we do and Jesus at the center of the gospel story because of the power that it has to really bring about the transformation of a generation. Here's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 3. He says, so if the good news that we tell others is covered with a veil, it is hidden from those who are dying. And the veil that he's talking about is legalism, rules, regulations, anything that we would add to the gospel in order to enhance the gospel ultimately detracts from the gospel. It's not the gospel plus this, the gospel plus that. It is the gospel alone that is the power of God to transform the human heart. So Paul says, let's not dress it up and let's not veil it up lest we blind the world to it. Our goal and our mission is to lay it bare before everybody and to say to them, we are a good news people in a bad news world. And the good news is that Jesus loves you and has paid the price for your sins. Number two, second thing, and I just said it, I choose to be a good news person in a bad news world. Believing the gospel doesn't mean that you ignore the negative parts of life. It just means that you keep on believing until you see the positive outcomes promised by God. Listen, my life has been intentionally shaped by the positive nature of the gospel. Lest you think that, you know, maybe Terry's embraced the positive gospel, which is really redundant. Because the gospel is good news, so if I call it the positive gospel, I'm only clarifying what it is. That's not another gospel. There's only one gospel, whether it's the gospel of Jesus, the gospel of grace, the gospel of the kingdom. Paul called it his gospel. There's only one gospel, and it is good news. So when I call it the positive gospel, it is just the same good news that I am emphasizing in all of its goodness. Now, lest you would say, you know, Terry preaches the positive gospel because he's just naturally a positive person. I would say, nothing can be further from the truth. I am not a natural-born optimist. I'm a natural-born pessimist. It's true. In fact, there are times when I feel pessimistic about not even being optimistic. I am that pessimistic by nature. But I become a determined optimist by allowing the gospel to renew my mind, not to wishful thinking, not to hopeful outcomes, not to some kind of of, of self-determined position, but by renewing my, my mind according to the scriptures, I have become positive because the gospel working in me chokes out sin and death and replaces it with abundant life and clarity of kingdom purpose. I choose to be a good news person in a bad news world. I choose to serve the Lord with gladness. Not sadness, not madness, but with gladness. I choose to to live a positive life that reflects the heart and soul of the gospel that we believe. And then finally, number three, I want the culture of the church, not just the church that I serve, and I know this is the heart of your pastor, not just your church, but my mission and my passion in these years is to see God's great global church awaken to the beauty of the good news so that the good news frames our culture. You know, being a good news people in a bad news world doesn't mean you live in denial. Doesn't mean you don't deal with problems. Doesn't mean you don't preach repentance. 
just simply means that you live with an expectation that the good news will produce a good harvest of good fruit if you stay faithful to the gospel. Did you know that the good news will produce a good harvest of good fruit in your marriage if you stay faithful to the gospel? Good news will produce a good harvest of good fruit in your emotional disposition if you stay faithful to the gospel. The good news will produce a good harvest of good fruit in your relationships, in your financial life, in whatever it is that is still not alive to God, the gospel working in you will produce that if you stay faithful to the gospel. Paul tells us this, and I'll close with Philippians 1 and verse 27. He said, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that when whether I come to see you or I'm absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Paul says, you got to determine to believe this. you got to lock into this. You can't just dabble in this and believe it for a moment and and then go away and say, well, I tried that and it didn't work. you got to ground and pound this thing out. you got to put your skin in the arena and fight through this thing. And when you get up in the morning, say, I'm standing firm in the gospel, believing that the gospel will renew my marriage. The gospel will bring back my wayward children. The gospel will prosper me emotionally. The gospel will work in my financial life. I stand firm in this because the gospel is the the power of God unto salvation, and I will not be moved from the gospel. For 25 years, the gospel has energized this good news church. And I've just come along this morning to just encourage you, keep doing what you're doing. Keep believing what you're believing. Keep proclaiming what you're proclaiming. Keep accepting and receiving by faith what you've been accepting and receiving by faith. Because if you stay faithful to it, Paul says, the gospel will bear abundant fruit in your life. This glorious gospel in closing is what it is. Because there is a man at the center of it. And his name is Jesus. And the gospel is his story playing out through human history. In closing, let me ask you, what's the best news you've ever heard? What's the best news that you've ever heard? I've heard some good news in life. As a 17-year-old boy, when I dropped down to one knee and looked up at my beautiful wife, Judith, and stumbled out the most miserable marriage proposal ever thought up by a man on the planet. And when she looked at me and in compassion said, that really stunk, but I'll marry you anyway, that was good news. I've heard some good news in life. After Judith had four miscarriages and our fifth child had died in her womb and the doctor said, there's no signs of life and we said, we're going to believe and trust God for a miracle and went back to the doctor and as Judith is laying up on the table and there she is with her swollen pregnant belly and the doctor is on the other side of the table and he's he's using the ultrasound and he's checking for a sign of life and and as the doctor's across her belly away from me, he looks up at me and with a perplexed, stunned and amazed expression on his face, he looked at me and said, I've got a heartbeat. That was some good news. That was some great news. I've heard some good news in life, but none of that compares to hearing Jesus say, if you repent of your sins and believe in me, I will give you eternal life for the age to come and abundant life for this age that you're living in. That news is the best news of all. And if you've never opened your heart to that news, the news that comes in and changes you, and positions you for a life that is blessed with favorable outcomes and an eternity that is secure in God's will, in all that he has planned for us in heaven to come, I want to lead you in a simple prayer here that will bring you into that kind of relationship. Would you just bow your head with me for just a moment? By believing the gospel, God's work, power begins to work in us, and we believe the gospel through the expression of a simple prayer. And just so that no one is praying this alone, I'm going to ask everyone to pray it 
aloud together with me. Would you say this? Would you say, dear God, I need a new beginning. I repent of my sins and I turn the reins of my life over to you. Forgive me, cleanse me, wash me from guilt and shame. Come into my life and be my savior. And from this day forward, I will follow you every day of my life in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you, with everyone bowing your heads for one more moment, would you just slip your hand up and hold it high so I can see you here today, just saying, today, Pastor Terry, I'm praying that prayer. Today, I am giving my life to Jesus. God bless you. Thank you for that. 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 Is there anyone else here this morning who would say, today I'm renewing my faith in Jesus. I've drifted and I've gotten distracted, but today I'm coming back to the beauty of this good news and I'm going to follow Jesus with all of my heart from this day forward. Would you slip your hand up wherever you are this morning so I can see your hands going up throughout this auditorium. God bless you. Awesome. Wonderful. Now would you lift your head. Let's give a great big welcome to God's family, to all who prayed that prayer. Thank you, bud. Love you. Thank you, Pastor Terry. Let's give him a great big hand. Good job. Great job. You know, the, the vision statement of our church to, that we, are, we exist to love God, uh, to lift people, to change the world, the, the real concept of lifting people is we know that when Jesus comes into our lives, He always lifts our lives. And I'm, I'm so grateful that uh, Jesus loved me just like I was, an 18-year-old kid who spent the past four years of his life getting high every single day. But I'm so grateful He loved me just like I was, but He didn't leave me just like I was. Anybody grateful? That Jesus hasn't left you just like you are. And the whole concept of, of a lifted life is this is the journey we're on, is that we're always uncovering and discovering uh, all the great things that God has for us. And I love the way Pastor Terry put it, uh, that we, we receive a life that's eternal for eternity, but we receive a life that's abundant for now. And I just want to talk about one concept real quick as we prepare ourselves to honor the Lord with our tithe and our offering. The Bible says this, Proverbs 11, verse 24. It says, there's one who scatters or releases, and that person increases all the more. So when you release, you increase. Everybody say that with me. When you release, you increase. And then there's one who withholds what's justly due, and that results only in want. The generous man will be prosperous, and he who waters will himself be watered. I like it in the message as well, if we could read that. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed, but those who help others are helped. Let's think about this for a minute. Generous people, successful people, Abundant living people think in terms of maximums, not minimums. They think in terms of releasing. What's, what's the best I can do? What's the greatest I can do? What's the most I can contribute? Rather than in terms of withholding, what's the least I have to do? Uh, what, what, what can I do just to get by in life? Can I just say you'll never build anything extraordinary if you're thinking minimums? Well, what do I have to do to at least keep her off of me? What do I have to do? What's the least I could get by with and still make it in life, still keep this job? Extraordinary in living is always built on the concept of I'm giving my very best. What's the best way I could love my spouse? That's how you can have an extraordinary marriage, right? What's the best way I could bless my children? That's how you're going to be an extraordinary parent. What's the blessed, best way I could encourage my friend? That's how you're going to be the best friend. What's the best I could do at work? And I, I would just say this. 
I would think of all arenas of our life, when it comes to serving God, when it comes to loving God, when it comes to our relationship with God, I would think every one of us would say, what's not the least that I could do, but what's the greatest I could do? What's the maximum I could do in order to honor the Lord? I think when we talk about the concept of honoring the Lord with our tithe, with our offering, I think sometimes people think, well, that's just sort of uh, not for me necessarily. But I just want to encourage you to consider this. For, for, for 40 years as a believer, for 33 years uh, in our marriage, Suzette and I, uh, even before we were married, we've learned this concept. We don't view the tithe as somewhat of a ceiling to try to reach to, we view the tithe as a, a, a floor to build on. And, and I want to encourage you today to consider this idea. God's called you to live an abundant life. He's come to lift your life. And, but to enter into that, it's going to, have, it's going to take a mindset that says, I'm not saying what's the least I can get by with, but I've got a mindset that says, what's the best I can do for the glory of God? I think we have to have this idea. If we really do love our God, then I think we're going to go for generosity toward Him. Anybody agree with me on that? Right? If, if we really do love our God, we're not trying to get by with minimums with our God. We're trying to get by with maximums. We're trying to get by with our best for His glory. So our ushers are coming right now to receive our tithe and offering instructions are on the screen how to give. And I just want to encourage you to step into the amazing life that God has for you.